Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in the Center for South Asia Activities. Um, I'm going to ask how many students are here, how many students are participating in that program where you're uh, going to write something up. Can you raise your hands? Okay. So I'm going to steer this talk to the students because the students are doing some labor here, uh, writing that uh, <laughs> report. Um, and I'm going to share with you uh, a direct connection with the Center for South Asia because the Center for South Asia graciously helped to fund my research trip to the University of Michigan this past June. I went to Michigan with, oh, about four research questions in mind. So I went to two historical archives, the Bentley Historical Library, which is on North Campus at U of M, and the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library. Looking back, these projects had a strange connection, or at least three of them had a strange connection. All three of them have anniversaries, had anniversaries, will have anniversaries. And so at the uh, Bentley Historical Library, I wanted to look at an event that is going to have its 50th anniversary, big 50th anniversary, coming in two weeks. At the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, I wanted to look at something that had its 40th anniversary back in April, six months ago. And today we're going to look at something that's going to have its 100th anniversary in two years. At the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, I was curious about 1975, specifically policy making, refugee policy making, that led to Vietnamese American, Hmong American, Lao American, Cambodian American communities in the United States. So I wanted to look at presidential refugee policy making, specifically looking at dispersal policies. When refugees were brought into the United States, they were dispersed throughout the United States. And I wanted to know the origins of that policy. So that's the 40th anniversary that happened six months ago. Look at that. That's frightening. That's really <laughs> scary. OK. But poison composure, uh, 50th anniversary coming up October 3rd, 2015. October 3rd, uh, that's two weeks from now, right? So October 3rd, 1965, under the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signs into law the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. And so October 2015 is going to be the 50th anniversary of that landmark law that for South Asian Americans is very significant. Padma Rangaswamy, who is an Indian American historian at the University of Illinois Chicago, said the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 was the watershed in Indian American history and by implication South Asian American history in general. Because the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 reformed the immigration regime in the United States, reformed it to the extent that it created a structure of legal conditions whereby there was more Asian migration after 1965. And certainly that happened with South Asians and created South Asian America today. So, Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, 50th anniversary, and now I'm going to talk about something that's going to have its 100th anniversary in 2017, two years from now. The Levi Barber Scholarship at the University of Michigan, as you've just heard, a particular kind of financial aid program, but I think that there is so much more at work, as you've heard in my abstract, there's so much more going on. And so I'd like to think aloud with you today about how to pursue that. Uh, at the Bentley Historical Library and the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, I took over 2,400 digital photographs. And so over 2,400 digital photographs, believe me, with a digital cam, you just work like a machine. And so over three days, I took 2,400 of those. What I'd like to do today is to not share 2,400 of those images, but to walk through some of those materials. In some ways, this is going to be a type of This is going to be a type of archival tourism. Archival tourism meaning I took those digital photographs. I'm going to share a little bit of the Bentley at Ann Arbor back in June. As you can see, a 
beautiful day back then in June. And when I thought about archival tourism, I said to myself, I can't think of anything more nerdy than to undergo archival tourism and show images of an archival research. But we won't go too far into that nerdy direction. Instead, I'd like to do the following. Can you guys still take notes? I just want to check on the outcome, but you can see it better, right? Okay. You can By the way, I hope you don't mind if I do this kind of weird PDF reader version. I've never made my peace with PowerPoint. <laughs> so uh, don't mind me navigating this side with this Adobe Reader, but pay attention to this particular document. Amber Abbas, uh, who I believe is at Texas, Amber Abbas, she submitted this to the South Asian American Digital Archive, and in many ways she captures what I'm going through right now, trying to go through 2,400 digital images. She talks about teaching students history, and I think this is instructive for everybody in this room, whether you're a history major or not, and she wrote, quote, a student of mine recently reflected that archives are filled with scraps of information but have no message, no theme, no thesis, meaning it's a mess, it's confusing. Unlike the professionally crafted and edited articles and books that he had read to learn about the past, what he found when he explored an archive was that he had to, and here's the point, sift through all this contradictory, dense, baffling information and shape it into a narrative. And basically, that's what I'm doing today uh, with you. Of the 2,400 digital images, more than 200 deal with this Levi Barber scholarship. And it is a mess. Uh, it's a mess in terms of what do I have? List of names, uh, list of names per country, list of majors, list of PhDs. And so going through lists, but trying to find the larger structure, the larger institutional structure that made this happen, and also something of the lives of the people who came to Ann Arbor from 1917 to the present under the auspices of this scholarship program. So this is going to be the struggle today. It might be of interest to know that the Levi Barber Scholarship is of interest more to just one person, myself, but in terms of South Asian Americans, the Levi Barber Scholarship has also registered. Specifically where on the web, uh, there is a website, Amber Abbas contributed to it. The South Asian American Digital Archive is trying to collect a South Asian American history, largely forgotten, largely forgotten, but they're trying to restore it and recover it through the study of specific kinds of instances, through the study of specific life histories. And so it's interesting for us today that the South Asian American Digital Archive has featured the Barber Scholarship. And so one of their sites on one of their pages, they took a peek at this program at the University of Michigan. How are we doing here? Is it too nerdy for me going through this Adobe thing? Okay. It's fine. It's fine. If it's really disconcerting and you're saying, God, I wish you used PowerPoint, go ahead and say, God, I wish you used PowerPoint. <laughs> As you can see, maybe you can't, uh, South Asian American Digital Archive trying to recover a number of sites of an earlier history. Agriculture, I'm assuming this image is from the Imperial Valley in California in the 1920s. Also, urban history, and as far as the Midwestern South Asian American history, here's a little tidbit. For many South Asians who worked in the Imperial Valley in agriculture, specifically in the cotton industry in Southern California, also in agriculture in the Central Valley in California, in the 1920s, a number of South Asians, specifically Indians from Punjab, learned that there were jobs, a different kind of occupation, different from agriculture, and it was way off in Detroit. And so South Asians learned that the Ford Motor Company in the 1920s was hiring African Americans, hiring South Asians, hiring Chinese, going to Honolulu and Hawaii and recruiting Chinese to work for the Ford Motor Company in Detroit. Unfortunately, they were brought in this, you know, Union busters. But they were bringing in a number of peoples into the Midwest 
for many people who had never heard of the Midwest, but South Asians working the line at the Ford Motor Company. Also, a number of South Asians, while working the line in Detroit, or thereafter, found admission at the University of Michigan. And so there's this kind of interesting back and forth, agriculture, industry, education, uh, an interesting kind of transit there, west coast to the Midwest. And the South Asian American Digital Archive interested in recruiting, or rather recovering, those kinds of sites. Now, going back to the Levi Barber Scholarship, again, I think there's a lot going on here. Uh, the Levi Barber Scholarship, uh, I think it implicates the following. It tells us a story about Asian women's intellectual history in the early 20th century. It tells us about South Asian women's intellectual history in the early 20th century. It is a story of transnationalizing and translocalizing. Transnational because many of these women, yes, went to Ann Arbor, went, were expected to go back to Asia, but a number, a number of them came back to the United States. And so there is a transnational back and forth, but it is also translocalizing because they didn't just float their way through, the, through Michigan. They didn't just float their way through the Midwest and leave no impression. They left their lives here. And so translocalizing in a very specific way in Ann Arbor in the Midwest. And it's also the story of modernity. And so there's a lot going on. Uh, the big problem with talking about the Levi Barber Scholarship is that for many people, the Levi Barber Scholarship is steeped in what you might call nostalgia. The Levi Barber Scholarship is steeped in quaintness. And so when I think about the Levi Barber Scholarship, I think of uh, a Twittery response. And it's not Twittering like Twittering, but the Twittery response when you're asked to give a talk uh, with our wealthy alum. And you're asked to give a talk with our wealthy alum, uh, specifically, specifically at the Betsy Barber House. And when you say things about the Levi Barber Scholarship, such as the followings, uh, many people who think about the Levi Barber Scholarship always have to bring up the same anecdotes. And one favorite anecdote of people thinking about the scholarship was they got a letter from someone in Asia, and an applicant asked, do I have to study barbering if I apply for the Levi Barber Scholarship? <laughs> Do I have to cut hair? And the response is, yes, good nature, humor. But I think at, at, in those Twittering situations, the Twittery response would be, oh, the University of Michigan. Yes, it's something I feel comfortable about. And I really want to break out of that. So to break out of that, I have two purposes today. Number one, to break out of the traditional narrative. And to, number two, to think about ways to do it. And so here is an overview of what I think might serve our purposes today. Going beyond the conventional narrative, as stated in my title, More Than, More Than Tuition Money, I think it's a series of more. And so more contexts of changes, contexts that are usually left out because the Twittery response was something nostalgic. Do I have to study barbering? Uh, more in terms of context of historical changes, but it is not just change. These were major historical changes and constraints. More in particular, the modern girl and the modern woman. More containment, what I call performing alterity, performing otherness, a way to contain what might be exceeding, exceeding as far as the modern girl and the modern woman. More conforming, what I call Asia orienting, I see the Barber Scholarship as participating in something that no one has ever really narrated, but is something that can be narrated with a great deal of richness and depth. Asia orienting, not just in progressive era America, but Asia orienting, in progressive era Michigan. And more exceedings. I think there's a lot going on as far as the everyday life, and there's some disturbing things that I see in the Levi Barber transcript. It's not just a transcript of matriculation. For official histories of the Barber Scholarship, it is a transcript of matriculation. List of PhDs, list of MAs, list of BAs. But odd things, just to give you a teaser, 
disciplined. I find these women disciplined in official ways at particular times, disciplined officially in moments of crises for individuals, but I can't help but think there was a larger discipline as well going on in the entire program. So let's explore some of this more with which we can go beyond the traditional narrative about barbering and must I learn barbering. More changes, more contacts as far as change. Levi Barber Scholarship, there's usually a single text that so many people appeal to when they try to understand this. It's a text that was written in 1942. 1942, a man wrote a retrospective of the scholarship program called 25 Years of the Levi Barber Scholarship. 1942, it's interesting, uh, the South Asian American Digital Archive drew heavily on this source text. The Bentley Historical Library on its website featured the Barber Scholarship, and it relied heavily on this source text. But again, very nostalgic, very quaint. The one major context that that particular source text mentioned was the context that was so pressing in 1942, the Second World War. But that was about it. But there was so much more. And so the Levi Barber Scholarship, begun in 1917, but unofficially started in 1914, here are some of those larger historical formations that stand in the background of the Barber Scholarship, but I suggest very much at work in shaping both the scholarship and the scholars. Big change. Begun in 1917, that meant just six years earlier, there was a revolution in China. Large change. And so a large political change, a revolution in China in 1911. In 1920, the first of about 33 barber scholars who were from India, 33 as of the 1950s. The first of 33 uh, barber scholars from India arriving in the 1920s. In India in the 1920s, we know there is a growing independence movement, non-cooperation movement, that is going to be a mass movement in India. So the 1920s change in India, political ferment in India, political change and turmoil in China, large context also at the border of the United States, large changes that do affect Asians. 1917, by 1917, the immigration regimes in the United States do take a very harsh, decided, anti-Asian uh, position, specifically beginning in 1882. From 1882 to 1943, the United States Congress both passed and reinforced a legal regime known as Chinese exclusion. 1882 to 1943, in that period, actually from 1882 to 1913, Congress passed 19 laws that both built Chinese exclusion and reinforced Chinese exclusion. Chinese exclusion originally, oh, Chinese exclusion originally an immigration regime that was designed to keep out Chinese laborers experienced and reinforced a sense of reinforcing mission creep whereby not just laborers, but indeed Chinese exclusion would come to mean a way to taint Chinese in general, not just laborers, but also classes that were considered privileged and considered immune from Chinese exclusion. So when it came to Chinese from 1882 onward, by 1917 when the Barber Scholarship is put in place, there is Chinese exclusion. 1917 is a significant year, especially for everyone here uh, studying South Asia and being here under the auspices of the Center for South Asia. In 1917, the United States Congress passes another Immigration Act. This Immigration Act creates the Asiatic Barred Zone. The Asiatic Barred Zone, B-A-R-R-E-D. I wish I had a map here, my apologies, but if you were to look at a map, if you were to look at a map of Asia, and if you were to look at a map of the Pacific, basically what Congress did in 1917 was that they too looked at a map, a Mercator projection map of Asia and the Pacific. And if you can imagine Congress with a gigantic grease pencil, how many people know what grease pencils are? 
Oh, beyond our age. Okay, grease pencil is something to uh, mark up meat packing, right? Uh, if you can imagine Congress in 1917 using a gigantic grease pencil, they basically marked off a big part of Asia, East Asia, stretching out, including Afghanistan, stretching out to the Near East, including the Indian subcontinent, and that area was barred as a barred zone, or rather was marked off as a barred zone for U.S. immigration. The exceptions would be students, teachers, and religious figures. So students, teachers, religious figures, Levi Barber scholarships in many ways could escape the Asiatic Bard Zone or Chinese exclusion or Asian immigration restriction because they were students. But let me suggest that uh, even though they could enter the United States and momentarily escape, no one could ever be completely immune from the shadow of immigration restriction. Let me make this uh, explicitly clear in terms of what happens when a Levi Barber scholar or any other kind of Asian student attending a university in the United States at this time, the University of Wisconsin, the University of Chicago, a school in New York, the University of Michigan. If you were in a situation when these immigration restrictions were in place, let's say something happens in your life. Your life changes can't finish your studies, you have pressures, you have pressures at home, you hear your parent is sick, you hear someone has died. Here you are in the United States, on your own perhaps, you're a student, your studies are disrupted. Can life continue as it is? Can you still be a student? Well, I guess you can try, but for another number of Asian students during the period of Asian immigration restrictions, a number of them had to drop out of school. Now you would probably say, okay, that means you take a boat, you're going back, going back to Asia. But a number of Asian students, not unlike today, had developed relationships, right? Had developed a life in New York or Ann Arbor or Madison or Chicago. And so wouldn't it be nice if you could at least stay, <coughs> maybe, maybe get your life together, work for a while, and come back to school? Sounds very familiar, right? That's a narrative we experience today. The problem was during Asian immigration restriction, if you were an Asian student, Chinese student in New York, South Asian student in Ann Arbor, if you stop being a student, your bubble burst. Or if you stop being a student, your protective bubble, meaning the immunity given to students, teachers, and religious figures under immigration restriction, you were no longer under that protection. What's worse, if you were, for example, if you were a Chinese student in New York or a South Asian student in Michigan, and you had to have some money, right? Your scholarship is gone, and you had to work, that immediately puts you into the labor category. And all of these Asian immigration restriction regimes were aimed at laborers. And so you immediately fell out of your student category, you fell out of your protection, and you fell into the labor category you fell into something very vulnerable. And the Immigration Service proceeded to go after people who fell into these situations. The Immigration Service, we can tell from exclusion records in the National Archives, would seek out people who were suddenly in this changed situation, and they would seek them for deportation. So, very tenuous situation, and my point is, even though students might have been protected when they entered the United States, there was always something on the edge. There was always something of a twilight. There was always something of a shadow that could befall you if your life changed. And so it's not irrelevant. Another major change, a cultural and social change, that affected the Levi Barber scholars, particularly, especially because they were women, they were young women, was the larger changes when it came to the emergence of the modern woman. And so the modern woman, seen to emerge during the progressive era, seen to emerge in the 19-teens, the modern woman, seen to have culminated in the 1920s, the modern woman was seen as that particular female of the 20th century. And as we know from US history, US history tells us that at this time, people had this very self-conscious 
embrace and grasp and understanding and claim of the 20th century as the century of the new. I always tell my students in other classes I teach, if you try to understand what it meant to enter the 20th century, if you try to recapture that sense of, I'm entering something new, think back to 1999. Think back to 1999 and the approaching date of December 31st, 1999, and 1158, 1159, oh my god, it's midnight. How many of you remember 1999, 2000? Okay, 1999-2000. Were you panicking? A little. Okay, it was uncertain, right? And everybody was talking about it. You remember 1999-2000? Panicking? Oh, I'm just going to go to sleep. Okay. I was excited to turn to 2000. What? I was excited. Exactly, new century and millennium, right? 1999-2000? Just Dick Clark, right? Okay, we're just going to go to Dick Clark. Okay. I think it's a nice uh, teaching tool. When people remember 1999, 2000, thank you everyone who spoke. If you remember 1999, 2000, there was that excitement, right, of new century and new millennium. Same thing, 1899 and 1900. And we know that 1899, 1900 was a self-conscious attempt to inaugurate new America, 20th century, Theodore Roosevelt would become in 1901 the youngest president of the United States, uh, entering the presidency upon the assassination of uh, the president that he was serving. But 43 years old, I think, young president at that time, in his 40s, right? Inaugurating the other kinds of new, the new Negro, seen as the 20th century African American, and the new woman, and so the new woman seen in the United States as being the new political figure, the new public figure, the new civic figure of a person who was supposedly in the 20th century going to move beyond 19th century womanhood. Now what's interesting about the Levi Barber Scholarship is that it's not just new woman, but it's a fascinating additional subtlety, an additional nuance to the development, the inauguration of the new woman. Because in addition to the new woman was the modern girl. And I think the Levi Barber Scholarship, founded in 1917 and continuing, was pretty much pitched back and forth between modern woman and modern girl. I'm going to draw upon something from our time. I think 1990s and 2000, there was a project, a historical project, that uh, was a worldwide, transnational, international historical research project. That historical research project was called Modern Girl Around the World. That is so cool. I have to ask the scholars, well, the students do. I have to ask the scholars, did you get email from Modern Girl around the world, or did you get any kind of notice, or did you, ha! Ah, you are. I have it on my bookshelf. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Mitra, your endorsement means so much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else, Modern Girl around the world? I have it on my shelf. Too. Okay, on the shelf. Have you ever read it? <laughs> Even better. But I think this wonderful cover says so much. You can tell a book by its cover. I would say you can tell a scholarship program by its cover. Wonderful. Modern girl around the world, modern hairdo, smoking a cigarette, looking off in the distance, don't mess with me. I love it. OK, so modern girl around the world. The scholars who were involved, the person I know is Kenny Barlow, who studies women's history in China. The scholar who looked at the Indian modern girl was Preeti Ramamurthy. The project of the modern girl around the world is to realize not only was there an emergence of a new aesthetic, not only was there an emergence of a new demographic, not only the emergence of a new cultural style, but that this emergence, something we identify so easily with the flapper, right, here in the United States, cloche hat, the flapper, uh, that not only was the flapper apparent in the 1920s in the United States, but all of these scholars realized 
Modern Girl was everywhere. Modern Girl was in India. Modern Girl was in the Soviet Union. Modern Girl was in the United States. Modern Girl was in China. Modern Girl was in Shanghai. And so Modern Girl was around the world. Let me draw upon seven, I'm going to show you now, seven quotes from Modern Girl Around the World that talk about the relationship between modern woman and modern girl. When I saw that font, I just thought of Dracula in the 19th century, so I had to use it. Think of transition from the 19th century. The distinction between the modern girl and the so-called new woman. The new woman or the modern woman is frequently figured as the mother of the modern girl. Contemporaries identify the new woman with reform and with social advocacy and political advocacy. They associated her daughter, the modern girl, with the frivolous pursuits of consumption, romance, and fashion. Thinking about girl and a historicized girl. And when I saw that font, I thought 1920s. Girl signifies the contested status of young women, no longer children, and their unstable and sometimes subversive relationship to social norms relating to heterosexuality, marriage, and motherhood. Now, I notice my time is escaping me, so instead of showing all seven of these quotes, let's think about these quotes. For some people, they thought new woman, modern girl, clearly distinguished, but these scholars have argued looking at cultural history, social history artifacts, looking at the details of the 1920s, that there was a lot of conflation. There was a lot of border crossing. There was a lot of blurring. And indeed, modern girl could claim to be modern woman and say that she would or have her own kind of politics. Indeed, I saw a labor newsletter once. It had a fabulous title. A labor newsletter from the 1920s. And the title of the particular essay was, Can We Organize the Flapper? Meaning, not just can we get her life together, you know, can we get her with a labor consciousness? Can we organize the flapper? And these scholars have argued, yes, modern girl interested in things like the consumption of goods like cosmetics, yes, cigarette smoking. But there was some politics involved. And in terms of confusing or conflating or crossing back and forth, modern women also enjoyed the aesthetics, also enjoyed the new aesthetic forms and criteria and practices of modern girl. Let me get now to Levi Barber and the Barber Scholarship in Ann Arbor. There's another kind of crossing of lines or blurring or going back and forth. Levi Barber's scholarship, you would think, would uh, be more appropriately entitled the Levi Barber Scholarship for Oriental Women or the Levi Barber Scholarship for Women from the Orient. Today, the Levi Barber Scholarship is still going on. It's called the Barber Rackham Fellowship for Women from Asia, and it's a graduate fellowship. It's not an undergraduate scholarship anymore. But you can tell, yes, women perhaps a more appropriate term for this scholarship but there's a lot of girl talk going on in the Levi Barber scholarship. There's a lot of girl talk, meaning not just Levi Barber himself, but so often when administrators at the University of Michigan dealing with the Levi Barber scholarship, deans, the dean of women at the University of Michigan, they would often talk about girls. And so they would talk about, oh, the girls scholarship, or the oriental girls, or the Barber girls. And so a lot of girl talk, and note, in some ways, this was vigorously enforced programmatically. Because before 1946, the rule was no married women could apply for the Levi Barber Scholarship. Fascinating. Before 1946, the rule was no married women could apply for the scholarship. In 1946, when they changed that rule, the administrator who changed that rule made a self-conscious effort to move beyond. That administrator said, what an old-fashioned rule. And so saying, what an old-fashioned rule, he said, this is ridiculous. Married women should 
get the opportunity to come to the University of Michigan under this scholarship, which included tuition remission and a one-year stipend. So that's nice and generous. And so why not women? But I think 1946 changing the rules illustrates for us that the Levi Barber Scholarship, 1917 through the 1920s through the 1940s, was invested in in an idea of girl. And I think that's my point. That's my interpretive point. Uh, That's what I'm squeezing out. That's what I'd like to hear from you. I think the Levi Barber Scholarship and the University of Michigan was invested in the idea of girl because girl could mean much of this girl, a transition state, no longer children, unstable, sometimes subversive, Girl could mean, yes, in transition, but I think the Levi Barber Scholarship was interested in girl, invested in girl, because girl meant futurity, not futility. It meant futurity, oops, I had two things, so (laughs) I'm not pronouncing correctly. The future, thank you, (laughs) the future. The University of Michigan and the Barber Scholarship is interested in the future. Not necessarily the long-term future of the Barber Scholarship in the United States. They were interested in the Barber Scholarship as far as their future in Asia. The whole purpose of the Barber Scholarship was to bring young women to Ann Arbor, study a range of things, but their future was supposed to be in Asia. Because the whole point was to bring them over and then send them back and they could be ambassadors. And the Levi Barber Scholarship used that kind of terminology. They were supposed to be ambassadors. But ambassadors of what? University of Michigan? Yes, they were supposed to be alum. But they were supposed to be ambassadors of modernity, ambassadors of the future, ambassadors of an American-shaped modernity and future. So a lot of girl investment, a lot of girl talk. Let me give you some samples. Levi Barber, speaking of girls. By the way, here's a nice image. The Asian Indian modern girl. Asian Indian modern girl. Particularly glamorous image from the 1920s. This is an Asian cinema star in the 1920s, taken to be an emblem and carrier of the Indian modern girl. A lot of girl talk. Levi Barber, who founded the Barber Fellowship, spoke of Oriental Girls, quote, the idea of the Oriental Girls Scholarship is to bring girls from the Orient, (laughs) give them an Occidental education, and let them take back whatever they find good and assimilate the blessings among the peoples from which they come. And so a nice two for one, you get it right off, right? both girls and that ambassadorial function. More girls, you probably cannot read that, so let me read it for you. Dean Emeritus Myra Jordan recently told of the first two girls who were invited as Barber Scholars. They were Japanese and arrived in 1914. Unfamiliar with the English language and unprepared to enter the university, they stayed at Mr. Barber's home and were tutored for several months. They even shopped for clothes on his charge account. From high-class Oriental families, they thought housework or homework beneath their dignity. During visits at Mrs. Jordan's home, however, they were taught such menial tasks as how to make their own beds. And so again, girls, but you also get a sense of the memory of the Barber Scholarship. Very much a containment, a containment of the social details and a packaging into this kind of safe domesticating nostalgia. Safe domesticating nostalgia, girls, and they had to be taught how to make their beds. But may I suggest the other side of girl, subversive, young, asking questions, Acting out, according, uh, acting out, acting scandalously in the 1920s. That other side of girl also agitated the Levi Barber Scholarship. And so, may I suggest that 
girls became something both to invest in, but also contain. And I'm going to argue right now that one way for the Levi Barber Scholarship to discipline a girl, not unlike how Dean Emeritus Myra Jordan disciplined these two Japanese girls, learn how to make your bed. Not only did Dean Jordan discipline these girls in that immediate face-to-face -face, intimate context of their own rooms, may I suggest that the Levi Barber Scholarship disciplined the young women but also inform the University of Michigan and the Ann Arbor community and reinforce the self-image of the Barber Scholarship by having the Barber Scholars do something I call performing alterity. Mm -hmm. Performing alterity meaning performing an Asian otherness and the Asian otherness not disparaged, celebrated as the Barber Scholarship would insist it was doing, celebrated through the form of, hey, let me, I want to see you do some work. What do you think? Celebrated through the form of what? If they are going to be disciplined, but at the same time celebrated, and they are going to perform publicly their Asian otherness, their Oriental otherness, then what would that be? What would that look like if they had to publicly perform? These barber scholars from India, the Philippines, China, Japan, Korea. And they also included Syria, and they also included Egypt, and they also included Cyprus. So what would it be to perform alterity in a safe, <coughs> contained way, safe for the Levi Barber Scholarship and the University of Michigan? What would be a, a way to do that publicly in Ann Arbor? Any guesses? Any guesses? Since we don't have time, and this is not a classroom, <laughs> since we don't have time, and, we, and this is not a classroom, yeah? Uh, you can have them do dances from their country. Yes, the cultural performance, right? And the cultural performance <laughs> that, bless you, the cultural performance that is very, very apparent and very visual for us and can be conveyed today is the following. Sorry about this primitive way. Okay. Barber Scholars, 1932 to 1933, performing alterity. And as you can see, it becomes one of those uh, pre-United Nations, League of Nations, okay? It's kind of a mini League of Nations in Michigan. And so the women wearing uh, their native or their dresses, the dresses identified with their Asian origins. And so from the Philippines, a Japanese kimono here. I don't know how to pronounce the name of that particular dress in the Philippines, but this woman is wearing that dress from the Philippines. From the Philippines, a Chinese trong sam, a Chinese trong sam, Chinese trong sam, Chinese trong sam, Korean, and we also note a number of saris. And so a number of women from India wearing their saris, I would call this performing alterity. Fast forward, 1942. And so, 1942, Korea, India, Japan, Philippines, Trangsam, Chinese, Philippines, Trangsam, 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 sorry, Trangsam, Philippines. You get the idea. Performing alterity, but here's where I think there's an inside joke. I don't know if this for sure, but I have to share this. I think there's an inside joke here, and it's a subversive inside joke. Everyone here is wearing what would have been uh, locked in time as something typical of their Asian origins, right? Of these dresses. This woman here is interesting because she's wearing what the Dowager Empress would have worn back in the 1890s. <laughs> she's wearing something that the Dowager Empress would have worn or someone in the entourage would have worn back in the 1890s. And so she's wearing this way back in the 19th century. Everyone's wearing what in the 20th century was the typical Asian nation dress. Empress Dowager, modern hairdo, 1942 and that cool smile right at the camera. I cannot help 
to think, I cannot help but think, maybe, 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 subversive, maybe, 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 an inside joke. I would love to keep thinking that. I do not want to find the letter from her, 1942, saying that she was doing this, you know, delivery, whatever, whatever. You know, this is my fantasy. Okay. It was subversive. Okay. Now, the other major point I wanted to bring up, which I have to get to really fast right now, um, I'm going to suggest that performing alterity was very much part of the University of Michigan's, not just Levi Barber Scholarship, but there is a strange pattern in the history of Michigan, not unique to Michigan, because I see this in other Midwestern states, but with Michigan, it is particular in salience, it is particular in continuity, it is particular in ongoing leg legacy of doing the following, something I call Asia Orienting. And so you know that was the title in the talk. Asia Orienting, Asia Orienting, we can see it already, the Levi Barber Scholarship is Asia Orienting people in Ann Arbor towards Asia. You've already heard me say that Levi Barber had an ambassadorial hope, hoping the young women would be ambassadors. But note this, 1870s, before Levi Barber became a regent at the University of Michigan, John Still, a regent at the University of Michigan, was an emissary to Korea, 1870s. Somebody connected with the University of Michigan, having, I would say, a high profile role in Asia, representing the United States, negotiating, mediating for the United States in Korea. 1917, the Barber Scholarship begins, Levi Barber was a regent, but before 1917, in 1880, the president of the University of Michigan negotiated the treaty that led to the Chinese exclusion laws. The president of the University of Michigan, James Burrell Angel, renegotiated the treaty with China that got the concession from China that allowed Congress to pass immigration restriction laws. James Burrell Angel, president of the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan in the 1900s would be actively involved in the Philippines. The University of Michigan sent its faculty from its history department, from its government department, from its law school, from what was the early beginnings of public administration taught at the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan sent its faculty to the Philippines after the United States took over the Philippines and did so much to create government infrastructure, Americanizing infrastructure, and you can call it an infrastructure of immigration. Because many Filipinos, when they immigrated to the United States in the 1920s, they said they heard so much about the United States from their teachers in the Philippines, their American teachers who taught in the Philippines. And so many University of Michigan faculty contributed to the making of that infrastructure that would change the Philippines and lead to immigration from the Philippines to the United States. Fast forward, 1950s. 1950s, 60 miles due west of Ann Arbor. 60 miles due west of Ann Arbor is East Lansing, Michigan. East Lansing, Michigan, Michigan State University, just recently come out of Michigan State College and its status as Michigan State College. So eager to be a Big Ten University, Michigan State University in 1955, in many ways following the example of the University of Michigan in the Philippines, Michigan State University started a program called the Michigan State University Vietnam Advisory Group. MSU VAG, MSUG was a program of academic advisors, was a program of professors, was a program of political scientists who went to Saigon to specifically cement the U.S. relationship between Washington, D.C. and the CM government in Saigon. And so Michigan has this interesting history, this interesting legacy of Asia orienting. 
No, this history was never hidden away. There is a record. The record's there. The record's in newspapers. The record's in speeches made on the floor of Congress. The record is in reports by the Michigan State University Board of Regents, University of Michigan Board of Regents. It was always there. It was never really brought together as a coherent possible narrative. And may I suggest that it is possible to bring these together as a coherent narrative that shows legacy, shows orientation, and shows Asia-oriented. That is a uh, frontier. I don't know of very many people doing this, but I think it is very possible. It is not strange or weird. Some people might think, it's so new. It sounds like Area 51. It is not Area 51. Uh, rather, it's taking a public record that already <coughs> is there and showing that there was continuity. And with Michigan, there was a continuity of Asia orienting, ending up with MSU VHE in the 1960s, but before the 1960s, was already there. And we can see it up front, visually, in something as close by as a scholarship program at the University of Michigan. So thank you very much. <laughs>